by 50. In fact, uh, I organized the thing. Uh, I worked for the US Geological Survey, and they hired me to actually do this. So this was done um, in the, uh, I believe it was 1993. We uh, ran GPS receivers along Highway um, 50 and measured about 100 points across there. And these points were re-measured a couple of years later to see how the Basin Range province was extending. And uh, these are the results. So here we have the uh, Wasatch Front over here. And uh, here we have uh, Eastern California. We started at Truckee and we went right across Eastern California, Basin Range province, and into Utah and across the Wasatch Front. And uh, this is the velocity in millimetres per year that our points are moving. So uh, we've fixed the whole system relative to um, stable North America. Okay. So when you look at things like this, you always have to think, well, what is this relative to? So we've fixed this relative to stable North America. This is the central part of the Basin Range province. As you can see, all this region here, from about the Drum Mountains to uh, the Clan Alpine Range, um, this is all moving at roughly the same rate. So the central part of the Basin Range is, is moving as a block. It's not deforming internally. All the deformation is taking place on the edges. So from this point to the Drum Mountains, the, the motion goes from zero to uh, three millimeters per year. So this zone here is actually pulling itself open. And the same goes for this zone here, from here about um, the, Genoa, the Genoa Fault, um, this zone is actually widening internally. So the Basin Range Province is not all um, widening uniformly. At the present time, it's, it's widening rapidly along this edge here, and in this zone here, and it's fairly stable in the middle. What, what was your time interval again? 93 to? It's about two or three years from memory. Only two or three years. Yeah, I think it was three, three years. Year, three years year But they resurveyed it several times. But that was three yeah. years, you were looking at? I believe that's correct. Oh, yes. goodness. <laughs> Going back to the last slide, can you show where Highway 80 is? This one here? Mm-hmm. Here somewhere? Yeah, yeah right there, there, where the salt ledge is. 50 is down. Thank you. He tries to sneak between all the mountains. Um, so, um, here's some uh, geological information of a uh, similar sort. So what we're looking at here is some work um, published by um, Anders and his colleagues. And uh, this is time going back in millions of years, so this is the present day, and this is 10 million years. And here we're looking at 0 to 250 kilometers back from Yellowstone. So Yellowstone is here, and this is back along the Snake River Plain. And I've uh, marked at the top the Yellowstone volcano, the Heiss, volcano and the bigger bow volcano. So we've gone back three Celtic calderas down the eastern Snake River Plain. And what Anders uh, did was to study the large um, range bounding normal faults. And he, using his geological techniques, he ascertained when these faults had had most of their rapid motion. And he ascertained that uh, the older ones, just south of um, Pigabo, they had been active in the period about nine and a half to six. And then if we jog along a little bit, uh, we've got Grand Valley here. Uh, these faults were active from about four million years to six million years. If we jog along a little further to um, another fault here. This one was active between about one million years and four million years. And the ones closer to Yellowstone were active from two million years to, to the present time. So what this is saying is that the period of most uh, rapid motion on these faults has swept east. It, it, it's not always been as it is today. Um, if we go back in time, the, the place where the motion was most rapid, the extension was most rapid, was much further to the west. So my colleagues and I have developed this model here for Yellowstone, where um, we, we propose that um, south, south of uh, the eastern Snake River Plain, we have rapid extension. North of it, the extension is somewhat less, and uh, the central volcano develops in this position here. So this is early in time, this is a later period in time, and this is later still. So we're proposing that the Basin Range province um, started widening at about 16 million years, but within the Basin Range province, there were always zones where there was enhanced extension. 
And these zones have swept east and west. Right. Yeah. So early on it was in the middle. Intermediate times, the zones of most rapid extension were to the east and the west of the central basin range. And at the present <coughs> time, the zones of most rapid extension are on the, along the Wasatch Front, <coughs> going through Yellowstone and uh, in the, the western uh, uh, basin range of province, going through the Fairview Peak region. So um, we propose that this is um, the migrating extension that's <coughs> causing migrating volcanism along the eastern Snake River Plain. Can I think of the eastern or the western red dot equivalent to Newberry? Yes, it's very schematic. Yeah. So let's take another look at uh, what's going on here. Yeah. So um, here we're looking at an aeromagnetic map that um, that's a little bit of a distraction perhaps. Um, what uh, Parsons and his colleagues have marked on this uh, figure of theirs is the normal faults, the active normal faults in purple. So these ones are south of the Snake River Plain. Here we have Yellowstone up here at the Snake River Plain. And here we have some more which are north of the eastern Snake River Plain. These are extending rapidly. These are extending more slowly. And in the middle here, we've got this volcanic zone. <coughs> so because it's extending to the south and the north, it must be extending in the middle as well. And it's ex not extending by normal fault in it. It's extending by um, diking. Extending by dikes being injected in these zones here, and Parsons and his colleagues have, have marked out where they consider the diking fissure zones to be in the eastern Snake River Plain. So my colleagues and I, and along with Parsons and his colleagues, we think that this region here is extending by normal faulting. That's extending by normal faulting, and then in the middle, it's extending in a wet mode by diking. The colors on that are they telling us anything? <coughs> Dark blues to the green. Uh, this is aeromagnetic data, so this is um, the intensity of the uh, magnetic field of gammas. So uh, Parsons and his colleagues, they use the magnetic field. Uh, it, it doesn't really help terribly much in this diagram, but they use them to assist them in locating where these eruptive fissures are. Okay. So um, here we have an example from the Place of the Moon National Monument. Um, in addition to um, making myself a nuisance to everybody who likes mantle plumes, um, I also worked for many years early in my career in Iceland. So um, the analogy to Iceland is uh, quite striking for me. And Iceland is, of course, on the spreading plate boundary where um, the, the North American and the Eurasian plates are moving apart because dikes are being injected along the spreading plate boundary. So, here's a picture of Iceland. I, I worked in Iceland for seven years, and in fact, I'm a naturalized Icelandic citizen. So I became very familiar with this map here. Um, what we're looking at here is eruptive zones. They're kind of on, in the, an on echelon pattern like this. So these are probably analogous to what underlies the eastern Snake River Plain, except they're sort of end, end on end, a uh, long linear zone like that. Instead of being side by side, <coughs> on the of the plane, they're more or less end to end in an echelon fashion. Um, if you superimpose the eastern Snake River Plain on Iceland, this is what you would get. Coincidentally, it's just about the uh, same length as the um, northern and the western volcanic zone in Iceland. There are a couple of uh, scenery pictures from Iceland, so it looks a bit like the eastern Snake River Plain, except it's green and. Um, and I drove along the eastern Snake River Plain uh, last year. It was a kind of uh, browny green colour, not quite as bright as this. And we have these eruptive fissures that uh, you see uh, on, on the front of my book. So um, I've drawn an analogy here. So here I've uh, borrowed the uh, last diagram from um, the, the previous uh, schematic slide. And as I mentioned, what we're proposing for the eastern state group plain is that we've, we've got an extending zone here with the extension propagating parallel <coughs> to the extension direction. So the eastern state group plain is pulling apart like this, but the zone of intense extension is migrating in a sense that's parallel to the direction of extension. In Iceland, we have a 90 degree situation where we have um, extending zones, and these zones lengthen by propagating their tips. So here we've got a situation in Iceland where the extension is in this direction, but 
the extension is propagating in that direction. So these uh, volcanic systems, they're developing end on end instead of side by side on the eastern snake of the plain. And there again, um, the, the zones in Iceland, they are somewhat similar. Um, there are central volcanoes which erupt rhyolite, sometimes a lot of rhyolite, and there's basaltic eruptions along the uh, fissuring parts uh, to the north and south. So this is more or less what's going on. I mean, to me, in the eastern Snake River Plain, the fact that there's ongoing basaltic volcanism all along the Snake River Plain, that is telling us that the Snake River Plain is extending. And every so often there's a dike injection and uh, a, a, an accompanying fissure eruption from the surface. <coughs> I don't think there's anything strange about it. Um, I, I had the good fortune when I worked in Iceland to work on um, an actual diking event. Mm. So on the eastern St. River Plain, of course, the last one was about 15,000 years ago. We haven't witnessed one. But in Iceland, we have witnessed one. Photographs of it like that. Um, on one occasion, um, this, this diking event took place in several episodes. It was, the dike was pumped in about 10 times. And uh, we would rush up to the north and uh, take as many measurements as we can, putting out seismometers and also measuring the widening of the rift zone so we could see how wide the dike was. And on one occasion, we were putting seismometers out and we noticed some, we were traveling on snow sleds and we noticed that there were cracks in the snow. So we thought, hey, that's, that's uh, interesting. <laughs> somebody, somebody got a schoolroom ruler in his pocket um, and what we did, we took the snow sleds and we just uh, drove east-west straight across the fissure zone. And every time we saw a crack, we stopped and measured how wide it was. And we measured 90 centimeters of widening. And you could actually see these cracks widening. I mean, it's like seeing the plates moving apart. And this is on the snow. On the snow, yes. So this is very young. What volcano? The camera? Camera. So um, I, I had the good fortune to work on this uh, episode. This was a very remarkable episode. I don't think there's anything comparable to it uh, being witnessed before. And uh, here we're seeing some kind of composite of all these dikes that were injected. So this was one dike, another dike, and so forth. And by the time it had finished, <coughs> after 10 years of periodic diking, this is the um, amalgamated dike that we had. This is 10 meters. So this thing was about 8 meters at its widest, and it tapered off the north and the south. And uh, we did lots of geodetic measurements, so um, therefore we have the widths of all these dikes. But um, shortly after this had finished, then GPS came along. And um, the reason I, the USGS got me to do the GPS in Nevada was because I'd been to Iceland numerous times and done GPS surveys measuring the aftermath of this dike injection. So um, here's, uh, here's me with one of my graduate students. Everybody in Britain has red hair, it's not just me. <laughs> <coughs> At this time I had a graduate student group and I had two Irish students, one from the Catholic community and one from the Protestant community. <laughs> <laughs> All they wanted was a quiet, to educate themselves and have a quiet life and get good jobs, they weren't interested in anything else. But anyway, so uh, what we're looking at here is GPS motion vectors, which were measured <coughs> after the diking had finished. So uh, from memory, oh yes, here we go, I use my memory, 1987 to 1992, so um, this shows the motions. The, the dike injections finished in 1985, so you'd think there'd be no motion after that. But with our GPS measurements, we found that there was still considerable motion, and let me see, this is a 10 centimeter vector. So um, these points here, they're moving apart by something like 15 centimeters in this five year period. Did you have any expression of where that extension was actually occurring? Good so what, what, what had happened was that um, uh, you can imagine, you know, North America and, and Europe are moving apart on average at about two centimeters a year. So then we have this dike injection episode, and this eight meter thick dike is thrust down the middle of the fissure zone, and the fissure zone pops open by eight meters. But of course, North America and, and Europe have not suddenly jumped eight meters apart. What's happened is the fissure zone has widened by eight meters and the flanks have been squished up. So what we're looking at here is the gradual unsquashing of the flanks. 
otherwise known as a um, post diking stress transient. So we measured this for a number of years and we were able to calculate the viscosity of the asthenosphere from how rapidly flanks were unsquashing. But I'm mentioning this because um, I think it's relevant to the Eastern Snake River Plain. Um, I, I think um, our data are probably uh, down here somewhere. Um, but subsequent to the um, survey that I did with the USGS, lots of people have done lots of GPS surveying, and I'm sure you've been shown um, deformation pictures by other speakers. And if you look at the Eastern Snake River Plain, you see all these little motion arrows are sort of roughly the same length. And people have proposed that the whole of the Eastern Snake River Plain is just one block, which is not deforming internally, and it's just moving as a whole in a big chunk. But of course, this is what you would see in, in a the time period is 1994 to 2010, so we have a 16-year time period here. But we haven't had a diking event in 16 years. If this is, there, there, there have been many basaltic eruptions, which, as I say, indicate that there must be diking going on under those basalt flows. But we won't see any motion or, or decades even possibly hundreds of years, because all the motion is taken up in very infrequent diking events. Excuse me, this thing you call a dike as an injection from underneath yes. of material in the right. yeah. yeah, material comes up from the asthenosphere, thrusts itself into the crust, and the two sides of the crust move apart. Um, this diagram does show another interesting feature, and that is, um, which I've touched on before, that south of the eastern state of the plain, the motion is relatively large, and north of it is quite small. So across the eastern state of the plain, the motion is decreasing from something quite rapid to almost zero. Two questions. You know, if you added on a good chunk of Wyoming on the other side, would you really see no extension? So in other words, right at the edge of your map there, the, the data says there's been no extension. I'm wondering if you go a little further out to the east, is it essentially no extension at all. I'm not familiar with those states since. Okay. Second question would be, talk to me about the curve. Why, why do we have this arcuate? Look interesting. There seems to be some rotation about a pole up here somewhere. <coughs> Okay, so let's uh, rapidly wind up by showing you another couple of examples. And I'm going to show you two examples. <coughs> have time for more. And one is Long Valley Caldera. So I know you're familiar with this. It's a large volcano at the north of the Owens Valley in California. So, Long Valley erupted about three quarters of a million years ago, and it produced 600 cubic kilometers of rhyolite, which uh, covered a large portion of the western USA. Um, so this is about 25% um, of the Huckleberry <coughs> Ridge eruption. So it's not as big as Yellowstone, but uh, it, it's not a tiddler either. This is a seriously large volcano, um, which has produced supervolcano eruptions. Now this is its position here. Here we have the Owens Valley, and we have the, um, the faults bounding the Owens Valley, which have normal and strike slip motion, depending on what time you look. And uh, when we get to the Long Valley Caldera, we've suddenly got a uh, western step, and because the um, tectonic activity has then taken up along this circle uh, here. So it's sort of on a side step, if you like. And uh, I, I think nobody sensible uh, would attribute this to a mantle plume. I, I was at a talk once where someone suggested it was due to a mantle plume, and um, the audience uh, kind of laughed at him. But uh, I was thinking yesterday, once upon a time, Warren, the audience laughed at you and they were wrong, so <laughs> we should always be a little bit careful what we laugh at and what we don't laugh at. But anyway, um, here is the GPS uh, deformation field for this region here. And uh, here we have California moving rapidly north, and this is moving rapidly north as well, but this is not moving rapidly north, so I think it must be quite obvious to everybody that this region here is an extension, because this is sort of almost fixed, and this is dragged off to the northwest. Are the, are the lighter colors falling? Uh, yes, these are faults. This is the Walker Lane in the Owens Valley. And uh, Riley and his colleagues, Riley is a structural geologist. I think structural geologists are more likely to be able to tell us more about volcanic provinces than seismic tomographers. 
And Riley and his colleagues have come up with a very complicated model here, which I'm not going to go into in detail, but um, uh, the bottom line is that he has uh, divided the region up into blocks here, and he thinks that Long Valley Caldera has formed here because there's an extensional zone, and that um, this has dilated the lower crust and allowed the stratospheric material to rise and create this volcano. The other example I'm going to swiftly give you is the Musgrave province in Australia. It's located in this position here. And it's in between three cratons. So um, here we have the West Australian craton, the South Australian craton, and the North Australian craton. And here we have sutures in between. And the Musgrave volcanic province is a suture triple junction. There have been a number of papers um, written by uh, Smithies, uh, an uh, Australian geologist, and his colleagues, and uh, they're very fascinating. They're quite dense, so it's quite a challenge to read them. But um, I've summarised some points that he made in a recent um, overview paper. Um, the Musgrave province, which is late Proterozoic in age, um, has produced 22,000 cubic kilometres of rhyolite, all in the same place. So that's three times Yellowstone. So they say that um, everything is biggest in the United States. So um, I think you guys have got to get your act in order because the Aussies are trying to overtake you here. They've got a million years ago. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, the area of this volcanic province is 5,000 square kilometers. So Yellowstone's kind of slightly overtaken by that as well. The magnetism, however, is very similar to um, Yellowstone, so um, I invite you to look at um, some of these papers. It's a mixture of rhyolite and basalt, and um, it took place over 30 million years, and there were at least two, probably four, supervolcano eruptions, but they all happened in the same place. So um, Smithies does not favor a mantle plume uh, origin for this, because uh, according to him, a plume trail 800 kilometers long would exist, would, would have formed in 30 million years. So in 30 million years, Australia evidently moved 800 kilometers. And so if this volcanic locus had been in the same place as, as plume would predict, then you would have this volcanism strewn over 800 kilometers, but it's all in the same place. <coughs> but I think the important thing about this uh, province here is that it's, it's an example that you can have a huge bimodal volcanic region, felsic and uh, basaltic, with supervolcano eruptions without a mantle plume, which this could not be caught by a mantle plume. And Smithies uh, presents arguments uh, about the uh, relative motion of these cratons, and he considers this to be a thin spot um, in the, in the uh, crust where material could rise and erupt. He says, uh, the Musgrave province is analogous to compressing the entire felsic magma track and the state group of Yellowstone plateau into a single volcanic center. And the conditions required are intrinsic to the crustal architecture rather than related to a mantle plume. So, just uh, one last uh, summary. Um, the gist of my talk, and uh, which summarizes a paper that um, my colleagues and I have in the press and which is available on the website. I can show you where if you're interested. Uh, there are many ways in which the plume model does not fit the Eastern State River Plain Yellowstone system. Um, we are not claiming that this disproves the plume model because the plume model is so flexible it can more or less incorporate everything. So um, our position is to point out the mismatches, and if somebody wants to say, oh, the plume swayed, the plume jumped, the plume split into two, people have come up with all these things, the plume is shallow, the plume is deep, you know, you, you, cannot, you cannot argue against that if they keep shifting their ground. A, a colleague of mine said that falsifying the plume hypothesis was like trying to nail jello to the wall. <laughs> There are many mismatches. Tomography does not repeatably see a plume. You can produce an image of a plume if you pick and choose and take your line of section carefully and um, <coughs> use the right color scale, but you could also do the reverse with equally uh, high quality images. The plate model predicts migrating extension, and we see this in GPS surveys and geology. And there are other analogous volcanoes which nobody in their right mind would suggest would due to mantle plumes. So, um, 
this is uh, what I have to present to you. Thank you. being done when the results are so variable and questionable. Uh, how, has it? I'd like to know that too. And <laughs> <laughs> we can't be cheap. Uh, it's just that I'm, I'm, I'm opening the cupboard so you can see the skeletons. <laughs> it's the best tool we have. It's the best tool you have. It takes pretty pictures which you can kind of make whatever argument you but want. It's it's like the oil exploration or something. Um, the thing, thing, thing with oil exploration is you, you do your work, you make your prediction, you drill a well, and uh, you, know you can you see have. if there's oil or not. But the trouble with this is, of course, you can show these cross sections, so oh, I think there's a plume here, or I think there isn't a plume here. How is anyone going to check? We can't drill down and see if there's enough plume there. So um, up until recently, we, we seismic tomographers have got away with it because I've done seismic tomography in several places in, in uh, Iceland and also several places in America. And you produce an image, and no one else has done one, and yours is the first, so that's published, and uh, prestigious papers come out of that. And um, who's going to come along and repeat that experiment? You know, if, you, if you said, well, uh, if you wrote a proposal for NSF and said we want to repeat tomography that was done at Long Valley, they'd say, well, it's already been done, we're not going to fund that. But um, now, now we've got all these data online and US array and a lot of money to analyze the data. The data have cost several tens of millions of dollars, so there's plenty of money to um, analyze them. And um, a lot of people are doing that. And now we're now in a situation which we haven't been in before, where we've got multiple images that we can compare. What instruments are most helpful uh, with your analysis? And are there are new technologies that get a square uh, view of what is going on. Uh, what instruments are most helpful with your analysis? And are there new technologies uh, that would give you a clearer view of what is going on? Um, I think we we need to do some. I mean. We've got our tomography, we've got our custom deformation modeling. I think we've got a lot of data out there, and what we need to do is to um, analyze it, I think, from a different point of view, because uh, I think there's a lot of information out there and it's not always joined up. I mean, for example, looking at deformation in a region which deforms by diking, and when you see none in a period of inactivity, you assume that you propose that the whole region is a block. I mean, to me, that was that's done by somebody who isn't actually, hasn't got all the cards in their hands. Um, I'm not sure what, you know, all the, all the different techniques of measuring, we've kind of tried them all already. And um, I think we're really hoping that there's something new around the corner because we are at an impasse at the moment. The tomography is not giving us the answer. The GPS is, is it works up to a certain point. It can help us understand things. But we don't have any sort of black box that can solve the plumes <laughs> controversy at the moment, I think. Jill, I'd like to pick up on a question that, uh, that John asked about stability of Wyoming. With GPS, you measure relative motions and you can put that in any frame you right. wish. Yeah, you, where's your but uh, relative to eastern Wyoming, or not eastern, but Beartooths and everything around the rim, call that zero, and from a standing start, Yellowstone is widening about three, mil three millimeters a year. So in which you ta way? Take a look at the at the far right in okay. Yellowstone, yeah. you've got a bunch of zeros around right. the back, yep. and never mind what framework they're in, they're in the same framework as the Yellowstone area. Yeah. And Yellowstone is, absorbs three, three millimeters. Well, it has done in this time period, Warren. You know, in the region where we see supervolcanoes every uh, so often, and uh, huge volcanic eruptions, then I, I would suggest if 
if there was a lot of volcanic activity in this region all of a sudden, then uh, instead of this being labelled, um, so instead of that being labelled three millimetres, it would be labelled three metres. You know, we would see a completely different picture if there was volcanic activity. Yes. So. And I'd like to pick up on another point on tomography, that even though there is this dense network of recorders at the surface, it can only record rays from earthquakes, 80% of which are in subduction systems around the world, and 20 are in ridges and other things. Uh, and there are a lot of non-registered directions. And tomography, in theory, requires multiple piercing. And where these tails that Jill was pointing to are put, there's no tomography in the sense of cross ties. Uh, delays are simply being assigned arbitrarily along the ray path. And it's not tomography in the sense of penetration in all directions. So sort of like the left-hand box in the lower right. No, the, the other box. Left hand. G. Lower right. Now, now in between that. Uh, that long tail off to the northwest uh, is unconstrained by crossfire. It's essentially a beam of nearly parallel rays with the slowness assigned by the operator downwind. Yes, in, in this particular experiment, the crossing rays would be in this volume here. Not right. 400. Yeah. yeah. Down below here, it would just be like a fan. The, the rule of thumb in the seismic side of business, in the oil business, is whatever depth you want to try to get a reasonably good image of, you, the length of your cube has to be twice as long as the depth you want to get. So if you want to see something that is 10,000 feet down, your cable has to be 20,000 feet from where your source is to the end of your receiver. So what kind of distance do you need to get to 700? That's one problem. Second problem is, is in the seismic business, you pretty well know the frequency range of the data that you're putting into the ground. This is earthquakes. It, very low frequency. You may or may not know a good location of where, this, where it came from exactly. It's pretty good. But by the time it gets here, it's all coming vertical at you, so you have no crossing range. So, there's, a, there's another important uh, difference between this and uh, oil industry experiments, and that is that you can place sources exactly wherever where you want. want. Exactly where you want. Exactly where you want. Exactly where you can't, as, as Warren just pointed out, uh, you have to put your sense out, you have yeah, to wait with your hands by your sides for earthquakes to occur in the Pacific Ring of Fire. And it's only, you know, usually <coughs> all your earthquakes are around the Pacific Ring of Fire, very restricted spatial distribution. Yeah, that, that I hadn't even thought about that. What they're saying there is what you really, I was thinking, well, you know, give us 20 years of collecting all this data, and maybe we'll get enough sampling density that we'll be able to get a little better images. Well, he just chopped it totally out of the sky because the sources of the earthquakes are pretty much all in the same place in, in these trenches, and, and so we're not going to get any new ray path. Yeah, that's the problem. That's the problem. So you're never going to sample. Right. Can you go back to the, the, uh, GPS motion near the end. Now, I, I have to admit, don't take me too seriously here, but I'm horribly crushed, crushed that you haven't shown me the plate model of what's under Yellowstone. And then this graph even confuses me more because I'm right with you on a plate model and the Snake River Plain and the Terror and all that. Perfect. Now you throw on a curve at me, literally. And I'm sitting here trying to think, what in your plate model is going on to produce this image? This image? The curve. The curve in the image. Curve. Yeah, well, this is, that this, this is a function of what's happening on the west coast of North America. Ah, uh, so you're still seeing part of the shear of California? Uh, yeah. This deformation here is related to what's going on at the plate boundary. Yeah. 
in, in the West. So um, as I showed you in that yeah, movie, it's it, yeah. Northwest USA is being sort of dragged off to the Northwest. And of course, this is linked to all the other plate boundaries in the world. It's not just this one plate boundary, but the, the plate boundary configuration over the whole globe at the moment is operating in a way that we've got extension here. This is rotating around in the sense you see. And if you look at other continents, Europe is pulling apart. There are rift valleys there. There are rift valleys in Africa. There's stuff going on in other places too. So this intraplate deformation, a deformation in the middle of plates, is what's causing volcanism, and you know, this is the pattern of it as you see here. If you wanted to understand this curve, you'd have to set up some sort of um, boundary element model where you, uh, you model what's going on at this plate boundary and uh, in various. Uh, yeah, the other thing, John, is with the craton and the Idaho batholith, you've got a very strong lithosphere oh, yeah, yeah, north yeah, of I that. So the then when you get out into Oregon and Washington, you've got younger stuff that's getting pulled apart. This is pulling apart, but this can't. Yeah. Jill, can I jump into that one? Sure. Uh, <laughs> that rotation is being taken up across the Columbia and the Yakima Fold Belt right. and the Olympic Mountains. Uh, crunch, right. the anticline in the Olympics, uh, and the extension is basically uh, what Jill showed on that evolving yeah, margin, yeah. uh, that once the, the plate, the once North America gets in contact with the Western Pacific plate, that's a retreating right. plate, right. and we're playing catch up with the general extension. Well, I had, I'd always and and the the target is moving northwest all the time, and we get a, a rotation which was not there in the early extension. The early extension was more or less margin normal, and now it's obliquely northwest, right. catching up with the Pacific plate. Yeah, that was that's the part that I I, I was certain. Perfectly comfortable with California getting stretched apart. I had not thought about the shear, northern shear, and I hadn't thought I would have seen it all the way on the far side of Oregon, which we're seeing. Am I am I seeing that right? Saying that right? Is that what we're really seeing here? Wow! But you get up into the Yakima Fold Belt, and there's the Columbia River basalt dipping right. 50 degrees in big anticlines. You, you have Big to, regional land acquaintance. You, you have to be careful not to be too kind of seduced by pictures like this. I know. The <laughs> fact is, if you held something else fixed, I know. if you held a point here fixed, maybe you held this side side, and it's all, all these arrows would reverse themselves. Yeah, if you held a point here fixed, you know, this curve might disappear. They're very dependent right. on the, what you hold fixed. You suggested that the Columbia River flood basalt said had exploited a Precambrian rift zone. I didn't really think there was any Precambrian rock in that province. Where, where would the Precambrian rift zone come from under the flood basalt? Uh, I'll defer to uh, Warren to answer that question. <laughs> the boundary between North America and young accreted terrains is in central Idaho within Idaho, and everything to the west has been added uh, in late Mesozoic and, and younger time. And that truly is the edge of North America, And but to get the same thing further south, you've got to move off to well into Nevada. There's an offset between, a lateral offset, and California and coastal Oregon have moved further west than the region to the north. It's all there in exposed rocks and in strontium ratios and all sorts of other evidence. The, the motion that you talked about, you did a great job explaining to me how that's really expressing itself now on the far ends of the spectrum, both east and west. And it, my sense is that the, the maximum eastern motion is close to the Wyoming border. Is that right? 
I, I'm just wondering what that tells us about the Teton Fault, which is maybe one of the last basin and range style faults in that province. Is it getting more energy, more extensional energy now than it used to? Yeah, that that plot absolutely fits with all the all the extension hitting the Teton Fault in the last two million years. <coughs> You know the chart that you showed it, it, it absolutely fits with that. Which chart? Keep going back a couple more. <laughs> Bingo, right there. there. We always talk. I mean, there's a Teton fault, all the motion until the last two million years was, was somewhere, west of us. Was somewhere west of us. So that that's what it says. That all, and the reason the mountains are so grand is it's all ascension in the last two million years. <laughs> now, there, there are other data sets there. that suggest maybe four. Maybe, maybe four. You've got That's other rotated four million year old uh, uh, welded tufts from Yellowstone. So, so what, what, what my colleagues and I are postulating is that um, you know these these concentrated zones of extension swept, you know, one swept to the east. And west on the other because side. the because the the eastern state river plain is extending uh, magmatically, because it's just at this critical place where the extension suddenly drops right up against where the crater suddenly the lithosphere suddenly becomes thick. We've got a situation there where the extension is volcanic and not by normal faulting, so the volcanism is sweeping east as well. That's the <coughs> point. Um, on the basis of your model, can you? hazard a guess as to what's going to happen, say, in the next five or ten million years <laughs> to the Yellowstone volcanism. No. Because they're going to keep <laughs> on the land. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I mean, it looks, the so, situation so. sounds like it's different in the next ten million years than it was in the past ten million so, years, some, or it can just keep on going. Somebody once said that it's, um, it's particularly difficult to predict the future. We need the stock market to stay. It's the same in my business. <laughs> this is concerning the Route 50 uh, GPS data. I'm not sure about the current accuracy of GPS. And, and, and that, but it used to be that the elevation, the vertical component of GPS was not as accurate as the horizontal. Any idea with all this fragmentation of the plates going on and extension and diking? Is there any vertical movement going on there? Or on that? Yes, there will be. <coughs> yes, of course, there will be vertical movement. And um, uh, I'd like to take this opportunity to point out find the right diagram, which you probably can't. Wrong direction here. show it too well, but um, I, I've got another diagram which shows the, uh, the topography all, all over this whole region here. And there, there's a lot made of the fact that um, where Yellowstone is, is a topographic high. But what I see is topographic low. I mean, uh, when I look at a topographic map in Western USA, I see the Rocky Mountains, I see a lot of very high mountain ranges, some of them just right here behind us, and it's very high all out here. And superimposed on this high is this, this sort of trench of subsidence here, which presumably has been uh, brought about by these rhyolitic volcanoes, which have uh, melted most of the lower crust, blasted it up in the air, scattered it all over the western USA, so you're essentially left with a big hole here. So I don't see a topographic high associated with the Yellowstone system, I see a topographic low. But uh, you're right about the vertical motions. The, the vertical motions in GPS are less reliable than the horizontal motions. So um, usually people don't make such a big thing of them because the, the errors in them are about two to three times greater than the errors in the horizontal. Now, in your model that the Snake River Plain is just a tear and Yellowstone is at the end of it. Uh, the, the Snake River Plain is a, a, a zone within the Basin Range province which is extending volcanically right. and is diking. I wouldn't describe it as a tear. Okay. What I'm wondering is there's lots of other places on Earth where we've got similar sorts of features like that. How do we end up with Yellowstone being such a huge volcano? Uh, is there anything in your model, in the, in the plate model, of why it just seems to be so much bigger than a lot of others? Well, you know, I've shown you two other examples which are both very big. Long Valley. You know, I, I think it's 
you know, in, in, in any array of data, you've always got N members, and yes, Yellowstone is remarkably big, and there's, there's really nowhere else on Earth like the Basin Range province. I think, um, as many, you could say for many parts of the world, there's a unique geological situation here. And All you need is more extension. Yeah, and you've got a lot of extension. There, there are other volcanoes that are as big. The Musgrave province is an example of that. Obviously, it's quite unusual for a volcano to be so big. It is ironic that on the west coast, Cape Mendocino, uh, south of that you've got transform margin, north of that you've got subduction margin, and what a, I mean, if you wanted a boundary that was going to give you something like you have in the Snake River Plains, uh, as, as that migrates off to the uh, east, it would make a with the slabless window and the rest of it uh, would give you the kind of imperfection or a thinning of the crust uh, with the, the asthenosphere that uh, you could concentrate uh, volcanism. You're leaving something out though, that Mendocino corner is moving northwest at about five or six centimeters a year. You can't project the Mendocino inward and no, no, tell not, anything not, about the past. I'm not, I'm not projecting it inward. What I'm projecting is the boundary between uh, the, uh, the boundary, boundary is moving. That yeah. corner is not fixed in time. The corner oh, is right. moving northwest at five centimeters per year. But that's the terminus of the San Andreas fault system. Yes. So north of that is uh, the, the plate characteristics are very different than what it is south of it. But now, that's an instant in time. Five million years ago, it was 250 kilometers further south. That's from Tanya at water. Yeah. <coughs> Maybe this a question to to Warren. Uh, you have the situation here, this particular slide, Western North America has been under compression for uh, many tens of millions of years. Uh, the Western, there's accreted. Um, you have the old, really stable craton more in the interior. This has been very active, uh, tectonically, seismically, for a long time. You've been accreting, compressing. Could, it, I've heard people use the term, um, basically you, Collapse of the uh, north of the western U.S. Would you would you ascribe to that sort of description? You, know, you, you end the compression. Uh, I, I, I would take you issue with the it. compression for starters. Okay. To me, arc systems are dominantly extensional because they're playing catch up with a retreating subduction system, and they're more often under extension than not. They're not be, uh, an overriding plate is not getting rammed into a fixed hinge. And so uh, in the uh, Sacramento Valley or the Oregon Coast Ranges, you see the very thin leading edge of the continental plate of a subduction time, and you see this undeformed basin of sediments that was only 15 kilometers above the subducting slab and that lasted for tens of millions of years. There's no compression at the edge. It's a falling away subduction and a catch-up override. This was different during the Laramide, though. Oh, Laramide is, is compression of the total crust for whatever reason. And so, but you, you know, in that 35, 40 million years ago, not long after that, you start to extensional system, the Farallon plate disappears, you, you establish the San Andreas system, and that's when the extension commences. No, there's Eocene extension in the Basin Range too, when there was all subduction along the mountains, uh, along the margin. The Ruby Carlin system, an enormous extension system, is Eocene. So what, what is and that was when there was subduction everywhere under the margin. Yeah. What is your current explanation for the Laramide compression? 
Uh, it's, you can express it geometrically as a rotation uh, of the western, of the Colorado Plateau in the interior west, uh, about an Euler pole, which is an imaginary geometric concept, not a right. not a flagpole. You can express it as a clockwise rotation of a few degrees. Uh, and so all the structures, the width of the Laramide structures and their trend change northward from narrow and north trending to splaying out to the northwest and widening, which is a rotation effect. And this, grossly speaking, is a slight slowing of the <coughs> western region <coughs> relative to the interior, migrating over the subducting slab, but a very tiny part of the subduction, uh, which is many thousands of kilometers of uh, Pacific lithosphere that has disappeared under the continent, while this rather trivial slowdown of the plateau block is continuing. Where's the location of the Euler Pole? No, uh, the where, southern where, pole is... No, you, you mentioned the Euler Pole as an axis of rotation. Where, where physically is it's, it put? It's, I it's mean, a geometric, geometric concept, concept. Not, yeah. a, not a... I know, but at uh, the geometrical level, where Somewhere is it? in West Texas or Southeast New Mexico. Okay, thank you. But the total, the total shortening across even the northwest part of the Laramide is a couple of hundred kilometers. Yeah. And it, during that same period of time, 5,000 kilometers of Pacific were eaten. You, uh, I've heard speculation that uh, a small continental mass might have gone down the trench. Uh, one Would favorite you? explanation is it hangs up on a submarine plateau. Right. No data. No, I mean, perfectly reasonable notion. Okay. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay. If, if we were to invite Professor Ian Cowell here, how would he shoot you down? <laughs> wow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No idea. He, he wouldn't. He would be crushed by the logic. <laughs> <laughs> this uh, uh, animation suggests that you still have a stranger in the post of your living You do. I didn't realize that. Yes, it's, it's still there. Yes, yes. So the parallel plate hasn't been entirely subdued. Well, I think it's oh, been no, no. renamed. Okay. Yeah, one, one. There's a little bit left. Yeah. Cool. Thank you again. <laughs> So briefly, you, you're saying this stuff goes out there and comes back here? No, no. Uh, well, yeah. But, but, but there's another one. This is a rolling GPS data. Okay. Um, so it seems to me a complementary the, one at the, the bottom. The main thing I get from that and this is, is the an extension, okay. which is, if you think of the field, uh, and so there is a tail. If you consider the divergence of the effective field, uh, and um, which, that which seems to be the extension. This all happening, as somebody mentioned, balancing it seems to all be happening at the extension Yellowstone. clear back and, here. And, uh, and I don't see, everything I don't see that's much, plated uh, down uh, is being transferred, but that's a relatively small part of the plate. Whereas this one is pushing all this stuff back into the Pacific. To me, this is. So so fast. Yes, to me this is yeah, it seems, it seems a, all happening right here. Could be the of that and, and, and the rest of it is I mean, it's it's just this, this thing is quite, quite difficult to watch happen around night. because um, where the extensions occur so is nice where these arrow, adjacent arrows are closed above it. 
and so we see kind of this in a number of places. Well, that's not. Yeah, so 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 we don't see it everywhere. That's another use of. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So those arrows are the velocity vector of earthquakes. So if the velocity vector can be very large, but if it doesn't change in the direction it's going, then there's no extension. Economically developed. So it's really I mean, it might be interesting to see this plotted in terms of like a color. Yes. This is being converted. It would just, it would just really light up right yeah, here. This is sucking yeah. this along. I, I agree with you entirely. Well, this is not the uh, most easy. I mean, this, this, this way of displaying, kind of drawing out the essence. Well,